Hi, I'm Pete Duncanson, Media Arts Pastor, and I'd like to take a moment to say thank you for being here. If you are physically here with us today, please be aware that for your safety, we are practicing social distancing and ask you to respect those that are using precautions as well. If you'd like to know more about what is going on right here at Central, whether upcoming events or just learning about who we are, check us out on the web, Facebook, and yes, we even have an app for that. If the ministry at Central has blessed you and you would like to give, you can do that multiple ways. By using the physical boxes located in the back by the sound booth, through online giving, or even through our app. Thanks again for joining us today, and God bless. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Turn in your Bibles this morning to the book of 2 Thessalonians. And then we're going to go back to 1 and 2 Kings. I just want to grab one, uh, kind of one verse. We're going to look at a couple of verses there. It's a very familiar passage to you. You know this. But uh, we're going to look at it differently today. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 5. Don't you remember? I'm reading from the New Living Translation. Don't you remember that I told you about all this when I was with you? And you know what is withhold, excuse me, what is holding him back. For he can be revealed only when his time comes. Now, the context tells us that there he's talking about the Antichrist, the one who is opposite of Jesus Christ. For this lawlessness is already at work secretly, and it will remain secret until the one who is holding it back steps out of the way. Then the man of lawlessness will be revealed. But the Lord Jesus will kill him with the breath of his mouth and destroy him by the splendor of his coming. Thank God for the day when Jesus Christ comes. Amen? It can be a great day for believers. It can be a great day for us, right? But I, I've been pondering a lot about this. So I want to ask us this morning, who goes out, taken by whom, and why? I want, to, I want to rethink verse 7. We've often said it is the Holy Spirit holding back the presentation, the coming of the Antichrist, and, and I think that's okay. Um, I don't know if I'm going to take time to go there or not, guys, but I, I wanted to show you the Greek this morning and some, some of the Bible commentaries. But basically, this is a, the, the, the reason that different translations just use the word he is because it's not specific. The Holy Spirit doesn't tell us who. But I want to switch this around. I was walking the other morning. I did not walk this morning, but as you know, most days I do. And it felt like the Lord nudged me and said, who is out of the way? And I said, well, Lord, the Holy Spirit is taken out of the way. Who takes him out of the way? You do. Why would I do that? Well, well, because, so I, I don't know. I just always thought you took him out of the way. And again, this isn't a conversation I'm having, but just a sense, a nudging. And I got it inverted, and I began to ask myself, what, it's, what if it's the unbeliever taking him out of the way? We find ourselves in this world, not just in America. Sometimes we have to be careful because we see things through America. We have a, a very... Uh, oversized media and culture. The rest of the world sees us much more than we see them. And I can tell you that by experience. You know it as well. But around the world today, there, it seems we're in a season when the unbeliever recognizes to an extent that there is a God and they want God out of the way. They want him gone. I think if you and I can filter some things through that, some of what we see happening around us, it'll help us to understand what's taking place, the reason that things are upside down or aren't like we think they should be or used to be. And it can be, it can be very overwhelming. It can be unsettling because we see so many things happening that are frustrating and they don't have to be this way, but they are. 
And I believe you, you and I need to recognize what it says here, lawlessness. This isn't talking about people who go 98 miles an hour down the highway and they break the speed limit. This is talking about specifically a lawlessness against God. Anything that has to do with godliness, holiness, they are now opposed to that. Not just opposed to it, but evidently. You, you can see the opposition. They're working against it. Many now are even missionaries for Satan. Many throughout culture, throughout our visible world, some with the, with the most visibility, the loudest voice in culture and media. There's this move to get everything and everybody that has anything to do with God out of the culture. And what that leaves is an opening, a window, an avenue for this anti-Christian, this anti-Christ presence to come. Lawless begin to push the Holy Spirit out, knowingly pushing him out. You and I have been reading through the Old Testament. If you're with us here doing the daily Bible reading, you're reading through the Old Testament, and you've just gone through Kings, right? Yeah, okay, just needed to check and see if you're with me. Yeah, you're going through Kings, not just about the Kings, but the books called First Kings, or as some would say, One Kings and Two Kings. But you read through and you found out there are a lot of Kings, right? And isn't it amazing? There are some good and a lot really bad, and they're really bad. And you can read through all that and you can forget whose King is over what and where and whose mom did what and why they killed everybody, and you just get overwhelmed and say, this makes no sense. So I'm here today, my role as your big brother, is to help you make a little bit of sense out of one aspect of what you read in First and Second Kings. Even if you don't remember what you read, we're going we're to remind ourselves today, amen? So I want you to go back and go with me to First Kings chapter 21. First Kings chapter 21. Guys, I'm sorry, I, I'm not sure where I'm going to put anything if I even am, as far as those uh, slides. First Kings... 21, and look at verse 25. Are you there? Say amen. Amen. No one else, this is in parentheses, but God wants to make sure that he says this about King Ahab. No one else so completely sold himself to what was evil in the Lord's sight as Ahab did under the influence of his beautiful wife Jezebel. <laughs> I added the word beautiful. His worst outrage was worshiping idols. Now, that's got a little asterisk there. And in your footnotes in the New Living Translation, at least, you'll see that it says that the original word here really refers to manure or dung. And so you get a glimpse. It's in parentheses, but God is showing you how he views giving your time and attention to idols. You are really just surrendering yourself to carp. C-A-R-P, but you can change it in case there's little ones in here. I don't want them yelling at me and saying, well, pastor said it. <laughs> I know how they are. <laughs> That's what God thinks. And this is what Ahab sold himself to do. He worshiped idols. This was the worst outrage. Just as the Amorites had done, the people whom the Lord had driven out from the land ahead of the Israelites. But, thank God, that we serve the Lord of B-U-T. When Ahab heard this message, he tore his clothing, dressed in burlap, and fasted. He even slept in burlap and went about in deep mourning. Then another message from the Lord came to Elijah. Verse 29, do you see how Ahab has humbled himself before me? Because he has done this, I will not do what I promised during his lifetime. It will happen to his sons. I will eventually, I'm adding that word, destroy his dynasty. Number one today, who goes out, taken by whom, and why? Well, I think the Holy Spirit goes out, it seems like, in the end times, in the last days. That's what he's saying in 2 Thessalonians. But who? I can tell you that based on one interpretation of the Word of God and based on what we're seeing, the world 
is forcing God out. The world is saying, get out, get out now. Take everything, take your commandments, take your holiness, take the worship of God and get out and never come back. Number one today, I've got good news for you. No matter how far you've gone, you can come back. Even in the midst of a dark culture, even when everybody else is bowing down to idols of carp, you can fall down before the king of glory. Doesn't matter what you've worshiped, doesn't matter how entangled you've become in addictions and strongholds, doesn't matter that you've cursed God and given up, you can always come back. No one, the Bible says, no one alive had ever sold themselves to wickedness like Ahab had, but but there are people, some of you watching me, by the way, welcome to those of you who are live streaming with us, but you gave up a long time ago. You got, you got tired of it. It just the, the, the strain of trying to live for God and trying to do your best, and, and, and you had never gotten to that point where you realized that it's not really about doing your best. It's about falling in love with Jesus and falling more in love with him the next day than you were the day before. That's enough right there. But if you can do that, the other things will eventually fall away. But if you get distracted, if you get looking over here or looking over there, it's going to be difficult. And some quit church. You just gave up. You might be here this morning in the building over the past months or years. For whatever reason, you had all the reasons. You could explain it. You could defend it, define it. You could justify it. But you missed the relationship you had with the Lord. We talk about, and at the end, a, a revival, something happening that, that brings people back into the presence of God. I'm going to tell you something. I, I do believe in a kind of an end visitation, but it's only for those who but. God doesn't have to visit anybody. He doesn't have to redeem anybody. He, he's not lonely in heaven. I read in the book of Revelation of a lot of angels. I read of four living beings more dynamic than any one of us or all of us put together. They have incredible faces, one on every side. They have incredible bodies and they're full of eyes everywhere. They can look at God from every perspective possible. And yet God has them there and invites us as well. But he isn't needing us. We need him. And he says, listen, if you want to come back, you can. I'm still right here. No one. Now, what we're going to do today is just look at three kings real quick who, who humbled themselves before God. You should have seen this. You, you, as you read through, you should have said, boy, this sounds just like, what well, I, I don't remember where I read it, but I think I read this before, and this is the first one, Ahab. The the contradiction is so dramatic that you can't overlook it. No one had ever sold themselves. Wow. What terminology. No one had ever sold themselves to get away from God so completely. He partnered with Jezebel and others to commit any kind of wickedness that he could imagine. If it popped into his mind, he did it. If it popped into her mind, he did it. It didn't matter how degrading, how demoralizing. It didn't matter how many people were hurt because of it or even died because he could care less. No one. She had Naboth killed simply because his garden was right next to Ahab's house. And he wouldn't give it to Ahab. On and on it went. And yet the Bible says, I love you. Listen, I don't know if you ever mark in your Bible or not, but even if you don't, mark right here, will you? Mark verse 27. But when Ahab heard this message, come on. When Ahab heard this message, he humbled himself. Verse 28. And then another message from the Lord. God had already spoken through Elijah. God said, I'm done with him. Not only is he going to die, I'm going to destroy every one of his kids and grandkids. How would you like to be related to Ahab and trying your best and say, well, I don't have a chance here because... When he humbled himself, God spoke to the very same prophet, the very same one. Now, this is a prophet who himself is somewhat prickly, you might say. 
Not everybody enjoyed getting close to Elijah. In just a few pages, you read that whenever the king sent people after him and the general got there with his 50 soldiers, he said, man of God, king says, I'm here to arrest you. And Elijah said, if I'm a man of God, let fire come down out of heaven. Kill you and all your men. Bam, before the words were out of his mouth, all 51 died on the spot. King said, another 50. He heard what happened. He said, another 50. How'd you like to mend the second batch? General so, shows up this time. Two-star general shows up, says, me and my men are here to arrest you. The king says, man of God. Now he showed respect, man of God. Come down off that hill. I'm here to arrest you and to take you in. Elijah says, if I'm a man of God, let fire come down from heaven, kill you, just like it did the last 51. Bam. The next 51. Now we're at 102 and counting. The third general shows up. He's a three-star. We find out why he's got three stars. He's a lot smarter. He falls down on his face, says, oh, man of God, don't kill me. So this is a prophet who's not going to play games. And when he walks away from Ahab, he's delivered the message, God's done with you. There is nothing going to survive because you have so completely sold yourself to wickedness. You demanded that God leave his own place. This is his nation, his house, and you have sent him out of here. And when you did that, you've sealed your own certificate of death. Before he's out on the main street... Ahab is on his face. God, I'm sorry. And the Lord speaks to Elijah and says, turn around and go back and look at Ahab. You go look at how broken he is. You go look at how, how surrendered he is to me. You look at the transformation that's taken place. And let me tell you something, Elijah, and every person that ever lives after you, let me remind you that I'm the God of grace. If you want a picture of God in the Old Testament, then get the picture out that he's always mad at you, that he wants to kill everybody and their brother, and get this picture in, that the moment Ahab, the most wicked one that had ever lived, the moment he broke before God, God said, I am thrilled with the change in your countenance and in your position. I am going to come running back to you and I am going to restore you. Everything that's going to happen will happen later. But because you've humbled yourself, I'm going to bless you. Elijah says, whoo, <laughs> I'm not sure I'm really hearing God. <laughs> now we don't read that he, he said that, but the Bible says in James, he was a man just like you and I. So I'm allowed to put myself right there in his position. And I'm walking out saying, boy, I... I gave the king the word today. Yeah, that'll teach him not to rise up against God again. Wait, what? Go tell him he's forgiven. Wait, what? No, no, he's married to Jezebel. You know that woman. Great God in heaven. What is that happening up there? What, what's going on? Stop that. Stop that. Listen, I want to emphasize this for you. No matter how far you've gone, you can come back while everyone else is making the Spirit leave. You can individually bring Him back to your life. I don't know that we're going to see nations shaken by the Spirit of God in these last days. I don't know that entire cultures are going to fall down, but what I do know is that until the trumpet sounds, the angel shouts, and Jesus returns, any person alive, any man or woman, any boy or girl, no matter how far you've gone, no matter how bad you've sinned, no matter how much you've rejected God, hated God, blasphemed God, you can come back at any moment. God's grace is enough for you. There is nothing you've done that separates you from God when you say, I'm sorry. <laughs> Hallelujah. That's the God we serve. That's the God of the Old Testament and the New. I'm running out of time. Go with me now to 2 Kings chapter 20. 2 Kings chapter 20. You know this one as well. Look at verse 1. About that time, Hezekiah became deathly ill, and the prophet Isaiah, son of Amos, went to visit him. He gave the king this message. This is what the Lord says. This is what the Lord says. Set your affairs in order, for you're going to die. You'll never recover from this illness. Listen. Until the trumpet sounds, the angel shouts, and Jesus comes. The believers are going to die, just like the unbelievers. I mean physically. I don't like it. You don't like it. I'll be happy when I die. I don't like it when the people I love die.
It's supposed to be that way. It's supposed to hurt. If it didn't hurt, what would be the value to life? And that hurting, Paul says in 1 Thessalonians that, that we grieve. And, and he says, I don't want you to grieve as those that have no hope. And there are times when we've got to be ready that even when it's a word from God, that word may not be, I'm going to heal you. That word may be, I'm going to take you. Verse 2, when Hezekiah heard this, he turned his face to the wall and prayed to the Lord. Remember, O Lord, how I've always been faithful to you and have served you single-mindedly, always doing what pleases you. Then he broke down and wept bitterly. And see, you can, you can look at the difference here with him and Ahab. Ahab did everything wicked. Hezekiah does everything right. And yet when Hezekiah gets sick, God says, I'm sorry, you're going to die. It doesn't, it doesn't always translate in this life that because you serve God faithfully, you never suffer or you're never sick or you don't die younger than you should. I'm sorry. I, I know there are people out there who say, you know, if, if you're not of a certain age and, and, and you're dying, there's something wrong, that you should never die before your time. Well, who knows your time? Today is the day of salvation. We don't know if we have tomorrow. Unless I miss something somewhere. My job is to be faithful to God. You read about David. What did David say when they were throwing stones at him as he was leaving Jerusalem? Absalom's taking over the throne. And wasn't that crazy? I mean, you're the king. You're also his dad. And, and instead of saying, whoa, stop this nonsense, what does David say? Get all my stuff. Let's go. Let's get out of here. Absalom's going to take over and he'll kill us all. I read that in like three sentences and thought, well, this is insanity. And David goes out, and they're throwing stones at him and cursing him. And his guys say, you give us permission, we'll kill him and all the rest. And David says this. It was, I love it. Why shouldn't he curse me? My own son's taken over. If God's done with me, he's done with me. If God is through with me, he's through with me. We serve the king of glory. We don't serve ourselves. None of us wants to die early. None of us wants to be sick. No, I don't. I, and here's what I want to tell you. Let's read on. There's good news here. Verse 4. Uh, he broke down and wept bitterly. But before Isaiah had left the middle courtyard. Wow. God's, God's got a plan. Uh, he's got a pattern here, doesn't he? This message came to him from the Lord. Go back to Hezekiah, the leader of my people. Tell him, this is what the Lord, the God of your ancestor David, said. I've heard your prayer and seen your tears. I will heal you, and three days from now, you will get out of bed and go to the temple of the Lord. Number two, I don't care what's happening around us. I don't care what's going on in our world. I don't care what's happening in America. Number one, no matter what's going on, you and I can come back to the Lord. Number two, no matter how ill you or I have been, we can seek healing. Hallelujah. We can. We're allowed. We're supposed to. We're encouraged to. Now, if God says, listen, that's not my plan. That's not what's going to happen to you. Well, then he's going to give us the emotional strength to handle what his plan for us is. But if on the way to asking, God says, I've seen your heart. I've seen your prayer. I'm going to heal you. Hallelujah. It's win-win, right? But never quit. Don't give up. Don't stop. You're allowed to ask for healing. Sister Linda was speaking Wednesday night, and she, having gone through cancer and everything she went through, she shared the different things that the Lord nudged her about. Do this and listen to that and speak this into you and how all of those things together and her obeying that, giving herself to that, how that healing came, that's the goodness of God. God is a healing God. Amen? We're allowed to ask him. I cannot promise you. I cannot stand here. He may promise you that he'll heal you, but I cannot promise you that he'll heal you, but I can promise you he's a healing God. And if you love him and you have new life, that new life begins the moment the old one ends. Hallelujah. Praise God. Your last breath here gives way to your first breath there. We release you here. Somebody receives you there. Praise God. Most of us are hoping it's Jesus with his hand out, but some of us think, okay, well, I, I want to see my, my wife or my husband, my son or my daughter, my mom or my dad. Somebody's going to be there to say hello. And they'll have some sheets, gift cards for you. And <laughs> I, I said to Sister Pam this morning, would you welcome the, the first-time guests? And she said, sure, what, what, do I give, what are we giving them? I said, we're not giving them anything. 
Well, what do I tell them? Just tell them we're glad they're here. Well, there should be something more than just saying, hey, we're glad you rolled out of bed this morning and came to church. Nope, sorry, that's it. We got nothing else. For those of you who may not know, we had a little season where we did give away gift cards and a new car every once in a while. But <laughs> you missed that day, sorry. God is a healing God, and you have every right as a believer, as a son or daughter of God. You have every right. As a matter of fact, God expects you to ask him. The prophet came in. Now, it's not Elijah. This is Isaiah. But the prophet Isaiah rolls in and says, listen, king, I got bad news for you as far as the kingdom and all of that. Here, it's good news you're going to be with the Lord. But I got to tell you, you are not going to recover. The Lord spoke to me, told me to come and tell you. I got to tell you, that's tough prophecy. Nobody likes to hear a prophecy like that. How many of you come to church once in a while saying, I need a word from God? Hmm? I, I do, but I don't ever mean this kind of a word. Never. I never mean that. Choose your successor and get ready. This is your last week. And make sure the church is ready and say goodbye. No, no, no. When he leaves, Hezekiah turns over in that bed of illness, looks at the wall with tears and says, great God. Of Israel. I know you, and I've known you my whole life. And I say to you today, I love you, and your will is your will, but I ask you if it would please you to give me a healing, I'll take it. Isaiah is about 35 feet out into the, not even to the center of the courtyard yet, and, and God, who did this to Elijah, now does it to Isaiah. Hey, go back. Oh, I know. Why should I have to go back? I had to come and tell the king, the king. Right beside the king on each side are men, and they hold swords. So that if you come in to kill the king, you die before he dies. If you come in to give him a bad word, you die. If you come in to do anything, remember uh, Esther, when she said, listen, let's all fast, and I'll do my best to go into the king and get an audience with him, and hopefully nobody will kill me for asking. Isaiah says, all right, fine. And what am I supposed to tell him? He's going to die sooner than <laughs> tell him I've heard his prayer and seen his tears. And I'm going to heal him. You're going to what? This is so profound that when Isaiah does it, the prophecy is that in three days God will heal you. They can't even wait. Isaiah and the king, neither one can wait for three days. Three days. Three single days. And the, the king says, uh, oh, hallelujah. Isaiah says, what, what sign do you want to know that God's going to heal you in three days? Well, the only sign you need is that in three days you're not dying anymore, right? <laughs> Isaiah says, make it a hard one. How hard do you want it to be? You want the sundial to go forward 10 or back 10? The king says, oh, it goes forward. That's the way it always goes forward. And Isaiah meant, listen, it's going to go forward 10 minutes instantly. Not in 10 minutes. It's not going to go as normal times. And Hezekiah says, no, no, that's too easy. Make it go backwards. Make the sun go backwards. Yeah, well, well let's make it tough on God. If God's really going to heal me. Three days. You can't wait three days to find out if God really did what he said. He just turned the prophet around in your courtyard and sent him back in who almost died the first time. Now he's coming back to give you a word. God's going to heal you, and yet you have to have a sign that confirms it in three days. This is insanity, gang. I read some of these stories and think, where's all this today? Isaiah says, good. And the Bible says, the sundial went back. Now, I don't know what God did to do that. But there wasn't somebody out there holding a sheet and making the shadow fall a different direction, gang. I don't know. When I was a kid and first in churches like ours, I heard stories that I think were conspiracy theories that NASA had discovered there was 20 minutes, 10 minutes or 20 minutes missing in the evolution of life or something. I don't know. But I've never seen that in proof, never heard anything. But what I do know is it happened. I don't know if the sun moved, the moon moved. I don't know if the whole universe moved. I don't know. It doesn't matter to me. I wasn't alive then. I need my own miracle today. And if you are ill today, if you are sick in body, if you are diseased, afflicted, if you have any infirmity or sickness, Sickness. I know a God who is still a healing God. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. And he wants you and I to ask him for healing. There is nothing wrong with asking. He says, ask of me and I will give you. 
You and I serve the Lord, the risen Lord. Does he always heal instantly? No, that's obvious. But he does heal sometimes, and you and I might as well ask him. Here's the third and final thing. Go to chapter 22 now. This guy is my favorite. This is Josiah. Look at verse 18. But go to the king of Judah who sent you to seek the Lord and tell him, this is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says concerning the message you've just heard. This is uh, King Josiah. He's come to the throne after 57 years of wickedness. Judah, not just Israel, the northern kingdom. Wow, I don't know what I almost tripped over there. Judah, the southern kingdom, is now in a backslid, completely godless state. One king has served for 55 years, wicked as he can be, and then his son for two years, wicked, they kill him. And his eight-year-old son, Josiah, comes to the throne. Josiah is being mentored by the priesthood. And so you instantly see a change in Judah. And Josiah begins this deep relationship with God. It's so profound that he marches into northern Israel, even though it no longer belongs to the Israelite people. And he is whacking all of the stuff that's associated with Baal, even in Israel. He just marches through. Now, he does a lot of what some believers today want to have happen. He physically mandates the nation to turn back to God. He has had a heart transformation. And by sheer strength and force of his office, he mandates that everybody else line up. Do you know how long-lasting those reforms were? He died at 39. The reforms died the day he did. But something phenomenal happens here. It, he finds, the priest finds, as he, he saves money for the remodeling of the temple. And in the midst of that, they discover a hidden copy of the scroll of God's law. Or the, they find a scroll, a hidden scroll with the... Uh, Pentateuch, probably, Matthew, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, and a woman prophet, Huldah by name, is the one who's prophesying. And here is what it says. Go to the king of Judah who sent you to seek the Lord and tell him, this is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says concerning the message you've just heard. You were sorry and humbled yourself before the Lord when you heard what I said against this city and its people, that this land would be cursed and become desolate, you tore your clothing in despair and wept before me in repentance. And I have indeed heard you, says the Lord. So I will not send the promised disaster until after you've died and been buried in peace. You will not see the disaster I'm going to bring on this city. So they took her message back to the king. Number one, no matter how far you've gone, you can come back. Number two, no matter how ill you've become, you can seek healing. And number three, no matter what is happening in our land, or in whatever land you live in, you can avoid disaster. You and I can see what's happening. It does not look, there is no appearance. I'm not saying it can't happen, but there's no evidence, not only physically but spiritually, that America is going to repent, that nationally, that a high percentage of people, I don't know if that's 30%, I don't know if it's 70, but it doesn't look like any significant percentage is going to turn to God in tears and repentance and humility and fasting and say, we have missed you. And I'm not talking about those outside the church, I'm talking about inside the church. If we want revival, it doesn't start with a preacher or a bunch of people, it starts with each of us saying to God, I have done this and maybe even saying publicly I have done this and I have done that we can't even confess the racism amongst us <laughs> how are we, we going to get to that? so <clears throat> yeah hallelujah it, it, listen some of these situations, what I wanted to show you was there was a great article yesterday in the uh, Cumberland newspaper. It was an editorial, but the guy quoted from the New York Times. And the other day, one of the police officers, the police officer that was killed on January 6th at the Capitol, and the New York Times said he was smashed in the head with a fire, hydrant, fire extinguisher and all this stuff took place. Well, come to find out, the coroner said he died of natural causes. And there was no fire extinguisher and his head wasn't gashed. Uh, it did seem like the article indicated that he was sprayed with 
uh, pepper spray or bear spray or something, which is bad enough. But the New York Times. And then people wonder why we in the church struggle with the media, the news media. And we talk about bias. That's the kind of stuff we're talking about. Is there, are there issues? Are there problems out there? Yes. Those, those two down south, the, the, the guys, the one, four military guys in the restaurant. And the woman comes over and profanity and just lights them up. Because I think all four were African American. I'm not sure. But the, the guy who was being... Uh, pulled over by the police officers because they said he had no license plate and it was in his back window. And within 20 seconds, he's an active duty military in, in a military uniform. And they treat him like, like trash as an African American. Listen, that, th- those, those, are out, those are happening. But there's also this other side in which some of these are not racially oriented. The police are struggling to make a split-second decision in which somebody lives and somebody dies. Not nobody dies, but somebody's going to. Who's it going to be? And the media can come along. And I don't know what's going on here. There's some sort of push in this news media. And they do this every time there's, there's a, a, about to be a transition in government. And you would think they'd go back and read history. And it seems like they always get to the point where they think, if we do enough for the government... We will always have a place. We will be the most secure and the val- we will be valued. And yet every time, especially in socialism and communism, the moment that comes to power, guess who dies first? The news media. Nobody has ever given the press freedom like the American Constitution. It's never happened in the history of the world. That's my opinion. Right beside that editorial in yesterday's newspaper, uh, our paper puts up there the First Amendment and the four rights that it guarantees us. But I want to tell you today that as an individual, you're not going to change all that. You're not going to change the racial realities. I don't know, honestly, as an American, some of it hurts my heart. I, I don't, it's not possible among unbelievers. The more they talk about it, the more the demons just cling to them and make them. The more they say, I don't want to be racist, if you're an unbeliever, the more racist you're going to become. Because this is a hard issue. But I also don't get, I don't see any evidence that there's going to be a change in the culture. These things, um, what social media, listen, they, they dominate now. There was an article the other day I read, and it said the report to the, to, I think it was a report to the Pentagon, or the Pentagon reported to Congress, I don't know, but the greatest threat to America was basically social media to our our freedom. But here's what the Bible says. No matter what is happening in our land, you and I can avoid disaster. You and I can have a move of God no matter what's happening. I can't fix it. Much of it I can't change. I can speak to it occasionally. But I don't know everything that's going on out there. I don't know the sides. And sometimes these stories, just like the one at the Capitol, they have layers and it takes time to find out what really happened. But we live, oh, no, we got to know right now. And somebody has to pay the price now. Listen, we're in a time when darkness is in control. Satan seems to be running the show. But no matter what. The prophet said to the servants, you go back and tell the king that sent you, I've seen your heart. I'll take care of you. Don't worry about it. Don't worry about the banks getting too big or too small. Don't worry about uh, Bitcoin, Digicoin, Doggycoin, Catcoin. Don't worry about any of them. Don't worry about Facebook. Don't worry about Mac and Apple. Don't worry about Microsoft. Don't worry about Bill Gates. Don't worry about the former president, the present president, the next president. Don't worry about You worry about you and how you and I are you with Jesus. How we are and him coming back. Because one of these days, the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, the voice of the archangel and the trump of God, and we are going home home. We don't belong here. This isn't our home. He's getting us ready for there. Hallelujah. Praise God. Come on, stand with me this morning. We're out of time. We've taken enough time today. Praise God. But I want to give you a chance to pray this morning and to spend a moment or two. Some of you came during the worship time, but I want to give you the opportunity to have an altar there at your seat for just one, two, two minutes, two and a half minutes. 
Or maybe you want an altar here and you want to say to God, just like King Josiah, I want to humble myself. This is the God of the Old Testament. If he was this way in the Old Testament, how much more is he in the, in the New Testament, the God of grace and mercy and love? He sent his son, Jesus Christ, to die for us. We don't have to have a king, a priest. We don't have to have a prophet. We have Jesus Christ, who is the king, the priest, and the prophet. And in coming to him, you are coming to the one who can make you holy, keep you connected to God, and bring you home safely. He's the one. He's the path. He's the blood. He's the cross. He's the deliverer, the healer. He's the restorer. He's the one who can rescue you out of addictions, entanglements, strongholds, fears, shame. He can rescue you out of heartache, abuse. He can rescue you out of depression, discouragement, fear. He can rescue you out of anything and everything. He can preserve you faultless until the day of his appearing. He can prepare you for that day. He can mature you in this life and cause you to no longer look to your left or your right, but to simply see him in all things and everything. The news media seems to want us stirred up. They seem to want us ready to hurt each other, fight each other. But the Bible says as much as possible, be at peace with all men. As much as possible, be at peace with all men. Doesn't say saved men. Doesn't say Democrat men or Republican men. Doesn't say white men, black men. It says as much as possible. That means we got to do everything. That's, that's the effort it takes on our part to be at peace. Bow your hearts with me for just a moment this morning. If you don't know the King of glory, why don't you make him your Lord right now? But if you know him, Maybe you need healing today. This altar's open for healing. There's a prayer team coming to be here to pray with you on my right and my left. But if you'd like to pray by yourself, just go on past them and to the far left and far right of the altar and just kneel down and say, Lord, I just want to take two minutes with you today. And in these two minutes, I want to cry out to you. If you need a physical touch, he's a healing God and he wants us to seek healing. If you need to be set free from something, he's a healing, delivering God, and he wants you to be delivered. If you're discouraged today, overwhelmed, unsure, you need direction, purpose, he's the God that wants to give that. As I pray, as I pray, you make connection with him. Lord, thank you today. Thank you so much for touching us and helping us. Thank you for being our healer today. Thank you, thank you, thank you for being our deliverer. Oh, how we worship you. Jesus, we worship you. Come on, if you want a few moments at the altar today, if you want somebody to agree with you, slip out of where you are. Just slip out of that place that you are and come and let somebody pray with you today and say, I need a touch from heaven. I want God to touch me and heal me today. If you've never given your life to Jesus and you want me to pray with you, you want to begin a life of following Jesus and you slip out of where you are and meet me right here, and we'll talk about living for Jesus. Brother Ricky's going to lead us in another song for just a moment before we close out this morning. What a great way to start your week. What a great way to head into your Monday, being in the house of the Lord and lifting up that mighty name of Jesus. Lord, heal in this place. Would you heal? I ask you, just like Hezekiah asked you, I ask you to heal today, Lord. There are brothers and sisters of mine here and they need healing. I know some, Lord. I know some that are in treatment for cancer. I know some that are overwhelmed with a physical condition and I pray for healing today. I pray for younger people who need a healing. I pray for older people. I pray for joints that knees, hips, shoulders, that there would be healing for joints today. I pray for eyes, Lord. There are people struggling with eye conditions, eye disorders. I pray that you would come with healing power for eyes and sight. I pray, Lord, for hearing and those who are struggling, those that have ringing in the ears, those who are being overwhelmed by a hearing ailment or condition. I pray for healing for those who have hearing impairment. Lord, I pray for muscle, those that have deteriorating muscle. And I pray, Lord, that you would come with renewing strength, power, restoration for the body. Lord, if there would be someone among us 
that's about to inherit the promise, who's about to receive the reward, who's about to walk into the presence of the King of glory physically, I pray that you would speak to them and tell them, I have you. I'm holding you. I'll never let go of you. You don't have to fear anything. You can walk through the valley of the shadow of death, and I'll be with you. I'll never leave you. I'll never forsake you. I'll bring you into your eternal reward. Thank you today, Jesus, for what you're doing in this house. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Hallelujah.